what exactly does that word mean? Let's just really go right down to the basics this morning. When a word is taken from the manuscripts, usually if it is a, a word that has to do with action, such as a verb and so forth, it is fully translated into the English. However, on the other hand, if it is the name of a city, a town, a people, or a person, usually it is only transliterated, which simply means that the letters in the Hebrew alphabet are translated to English letters, but the definition is not present. An example. Let's take the word Moses in the Hebrew tongue. That's only transliterated. Because that's what the letters are in the Hebrew language. The definition is drawn from water or drawn from the water. So really, in many cases, you lose a great deal by names themselves, not, especially if it has to do with cities and so forth, because God uses towns, peoples, countries, as examples whereby you can better learn from his word. Now, let's take the word kenite, K-E-N-I-T-E. Translated means sons of Cain. And any time that you do a study, you're not going to be the least bit interested if you don't know what it means to you or why do I want to know this? Why is it important that I know this. And then you begin to take an interest and you get into the Word and you translate rather than transliterate in many cases because you know that your Father is telling you something. So let's find the why we need to know in the great book of Revelation. Open your Bibles, if you would, to Revelation chapter 2, verse 9. We are covering here in the second and the third chapter a message from Christ to seven churches. These seven churches, one of the lessons you want to learn, they were geographically located in a circle, which means all-encompassing or to cover the whole world, even if you would. There were only two, I repeat, there were only two out of those seven churches that Christ did not find fault with. So if you want to be pleasing to Christ, or if you want to know which church you should attend, you'd better make sure that you're attending a church that teaches the message that those two churches were teaching. Those two churches happen to be Smyrna and Philadelphia, the church of Smyrna and the church of Philadelphia. Christ helped them up, praised them, and complimented them because of what they were teaching. And he even explains in the basis, most basic uh, structure why they were approved. And naturally, that had better be important to you today. And unless you understand the Kenite word, who they are, what they are, where they are, then you're not going to understand what pleases Christ. That may sound a little bit on the negative side, be that as it may for a moment. You'll find out quite the contrary. All right? So, first, let's go to Revelation 2, verse 9. To identify the church of Smyrna, which Christ finds no fault with whatsoever. Only one of two out of the seven. And unto the angel of the church of Smyrna write, These things saith the first and the last, meaning God was with us, was here in the beginning, and he's going to be here when it's all over. Naturally, that's the one you want to be with. Which was dead, Christ was crucified, and is alive. Eternal life. I know thy works and tribulation and poverty, but thou art rich. In other words, you are rich in knowledge, and quite frankly, when you understand God's Word and you have eyes to see and ears to hear, you will also prosper in this world because you know what the world is about and it's easy to
to beat Satan at his own game. If you understand the plan of God. You are rich, and I know the blasphemy, sharpen up for me, the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. Now, let's identify a couple of things. What is this word in the Greek, Jews? It's Eudas. It has, there are two people that can qualify as Eudas. That is to say, of the tribe of Judah, none of the other tribes now, there are 12. There's only one tribe, Judah. His children can be called Eudas. Or a citizen of the land of Judea, such as this is Arkansas, and we that live within this state are called, well, it's according to who's doing the calling, I guess. Arkansasers are, if you want to get uptown, it's Arkansans, all right? Arkansans. Well, then we know that there are some people that live in the land of Judea that moved there that called themselves Eudas, but they're not. They call themselves of the tribe of Judah, let's be a little more specific, but they're not the tribe of Judah, quite the contrary. They are of the synagogue of Satan. Now, my friends, both these churches that Christ approved of taught this. Christ is complimenting them because of it. Verse 10, For none of those things which thou shalt suffer... Fear, rather, none of those things that thou shalt suffer. You don't have to be afraid of anything because God has given us power over anything Satan has, okay? Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison that you may be tried. We know we're going to be delivered up before the spurious Messiah. Big deal. Hey, bring it on. No problem. Because the Holy Spirit will speak through you. That's the purpose that ye may be tried, and ye shall have tribulation ten days. Tribulation's a little bit of trouble. Did he say, you better be worried? Uh Uh-uh. No, I think most of you would look forward to that as a matter of fact, because you know that his hand is on you. Be thou faithful unto death. You're going to be delivered up before death. That's the devil. And be faithful to the true Holy Spirit and allow Him to speak through you because to not, as it is written in Luke 12, verse 10, that's the unforgivable sin. It's not going to happen. Anyone that knows Him will witness against Him on behalf of the Lord God. And I will give thee a crown of life. That is that crown of life, eternal life. The other church is the church of Philadelphia. You'll find the church of Philadelphia addressed in verse 7 of chapter 3. It was the only other church that Christ had no problem with. uh, Quite the contrary, he loved them and was proud of them and of what they taught. What did they teach? Let's find out. Verse 7, And the angel, and to the angel of the church of Philadelphia write, These things saith he that is holy, he that is true, he that hath the key of David. That's important. That's part of the church, is knowing and having, possessing the key of David. Can you explain that a little bit to me? You bet. Who was to come from David? Remember, out of the the stem of Jesse would come a root through Judah, which would be Christ. Okay, that's why it's important is to know the true Judah from the fake. Because if you don't know the true Christ, you're going to be confused with the false Christ. That is the key of David, is knowing your Father's Word, whereby you can protect yourself and mainly not be deceived. The key that he may openeth, and no man shutteth, and shutteth, and no man openeth. In other words, the world can't give you any competition. They'll give you tribulation, but you've got the key, friend, if you've got his Word. Verse 8, what were they doing? What was their works? I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it, for thou hast a little strength, and hast kept my word. Kept what? My word, and hast not denied my name. You're staying with the true Christ. 
You haven't denied my name because of ignorance and being deceived into some other belief or religion or one of these other churches that I have found fault with. Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews and are not, but do lie. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet and to know that I have loved thee. And the next verse would continue on, Because of this I have allowed you to escape the hour of temptation. That hour is the hour that the false Messiah is here, as it is written in Revelation 17. You escape it. Why? You're not going to be deceived. Now, let's get one thing straight coming out the gate. Are you saying we should hate Judah? That would be stupid indeed. Judah is our brother. I'm saying beware of those that claim to be of Judah and are not, but do lie and are the synagogue of Satan. That is what I'm saying. Our true brother Judah is loyal. He messes up like the rest of the tribes. But basically... Our brother Judah, our true brother Judah, has suffered many accusations because of the Kenites, because they call themselves Eudas. That's why Christ himself would say, these two churches are rich, that they have the key, they have the knowledge that can open the scriptures and give understanding. Now, well... It's, that's hanging a lot on those two churches and those few verses. But my friends, that, just, that doesn't even scratch the surface of the scriptures that claim this same teaching. The very simplest of parables, Christ said, understand. But he's, there is one particular one. You may or you may not know what that parable is. He said, if you don't understand this one, how are you going to understand any of the rest of them? You, I can answer. You're not. And that was the simple parable to the sower. Let's, let's open our Bibles, if we may. I'm going to take Matthew 13. Okay, Matthew chapter 13. Let's see what else Jesus said about these Kenites, the sons of Cain. You mean he would talk about them in the New Testament? Well, yes, he would. If you have eyes to see and ears to hear. Well, would Jesus purposely keep some from seeing for their own protection? Yes. Listen, chapter 13, you're, I, I'm not going to cover the first nine verses because you're familiar with them. A man took a, a pouch of seed. They were around his waist, no doubt, and he's walking and he's broadcasting. He's sowing Seed, And you know that some of them fell on good ground and some of them hit a rock and some of them were in just shallow soil. The dew spouted, sprouted the embryo. When the sun hit it, it died. That's the way a lot of people are when the truth hits them. Up here, they get a little opposition and, whoo, and they're gone. All right? Well, you don't want somebody like that beside you. All right? They're, they're worthless as far as being a soldier and in understanding God's Word. They wither, and they fade away, and so forth. But why? You mean really that Jesus would try to keep the in-depth truth from some because of His love? Yes. Listen to verse 10. And the disciples came and said unto Him, Why? Why speakest thou unto them in parables? Question. Parables are, you know, they're kind of like riddles. And he answered and said unto them, Because it is given unto you to know the mysteries, I repeat, mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it is not given. Some might say, well, give me just a real quick ex brief explanation of why he would do that. And, and I would quote then from Luke chapter 4, verse 13, where he would say the same thing. If you don't understand this one, you're not going to understand any of them. For the simple reason that if someone were brought to full knowledge and still worship the spurious Messiah, the millennium would be no good to them. So as it is written in Romans chapter 11, God sent the spirit of slumber upon them. Therefore Christ would teach in parables 
But he's calling a people, a people that do know. What really then, the in-depth, he goes into parts, he explains the seed, and then he comes to verse 24 of this 13th chapter of Matthew. Another parable put he forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven, you understand what the kingdom of heaven is, don't you? That's the king and his dominion. And heaven meaning the eternity, looking forward to that. That's something you want to know a lot about, all right? Is likened unto a man which sowed good seed in his field. Now, anyone can understand that, all right? But but while men slept, everybody usually goes to sleep at night. While men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. Tares or Zawan in the area where this is, parable is being taught. It looks exactly like wheat when it sprouts and grows. You can't hardly tell the difference. But boy, when the seed comes off, you can sure tell the difference. Wheat is golden. Zawan is black, bitter, and poisonous. Okay. The enemy sowed them. What? Well, who's the enemy of God? I, I just wonder. There's really only one friend and people that follow him, all right? But when the blade was sprung up and brought forth fruit, then appeared the tares. So the servants of the householder came and said unto him, Sir, remember, this is a parable now. Didst not thou sow good seed in thy field? Question. Does God only sow good seed? Yes. That's all he sows. From whence then hath it tares? Where did this bad seed get in here at? 28. He said unto them, An enemy hath done this. The servant saith unto him, said unto him, Wilt thou then that we go and gather them up? Let's get our hoes and little old tools and let's get out there and let's root those suckers up. Let's do away with them. 29. But he said, Nay, that means no, lest while you gather up the tares, you root up also the wheat with them. And I'm going to tell you something. If you attack the Kenite in ignorance, it's like batting your head against a brick wall. You'll get bloodied, but the wheat, that's to say our good Christian brothers, will brand you as a nut. And you will do no good. You have to identify, as Christ would have you, the bad seed. Nothing wrong in that, okay? That's why he wants them left alone. But how will we get rid of them? Verse 30. Let both grow together until the harvest, and in the time of the harvest I will say to the reapers, Gather ye together first the tares, do that first, and bind them in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. In other words, destroy the bad, but bring the good into my barn. Now, that being a parable, you would have to take my word for it or your own intelligence to know, well, was that Is that right? Have we got kind of a grip on that, and is that correct? Well, beloved, of all things, this is one of the only parables that Christ goes into detail explaining for you. In other words, he makes it so clear that children can understand. Drop to the 34th verse. All these things spake Jesus unto the multitudes in parables. To who? To the multitudes. And without a parable spake he not unto them, verse 35, that it might be, what reason? Why did he do that? That it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet, saying, I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter things which have been kept secret from the foundation of the world. And he's quoting there the, uh, David himself, Psalm 78, verse 2. What is secret? Mysteries? Secrets? Why, why did Jesus deal in these? It was a prophecy. It's part of God's plan. 
The word foundation, and you that have uh, companion Bibles are very fortunate because in Appendix 146, it breaks this back into the Greek, katebole, which means since the overthrow of Satan. It's a verb in the Greek, and it means since the overthrow of Satan, it has been kept secret. Why? Satan took a lot of God's children along with him, and that's what salvation is all about, is the reclamation of his children. He does not want to throw them into the fire. He wants to salvage them, and it is his will that all come to repentance. But I assure you all won't. Doubts, mistrust, deception, ignorance. Being ignorant of God's Word will cause them to fall, to be deceived. Will they be taught? Well, God will judge no one, but kept secret since the foundation. Pretty heavy stuff. All those parables about the kingdom being kept secret. 36, then Jesus sent the multitude away. Bear in mind, the mass majority is sent away and went into the house and his disciples, his who? His disciples. Do you know what the word disciple means? It comes from our word. Our word discipline comes from it. That students, serious students came unto him saying, Declare unto us the parable of the tares of the field. Now here his own people are saying, Explain to us what you were talking about. Bear in mind, you've got to understand this. 37, he answered and said unto him, them, bear in mind, this is not a parable now. He's explaining one to, not the multitude, to his students. He that soweth the good seed is the son of man. When the spirit was told to move upon the waters and man was formed. All right. Verse 38, the field... What field was it? Back 40? Side 40? Where did this take place? The field is the world. It's all of it. The good seed, oh boy, this is going to be interesting. The good seed are the children. We talking about barley? No. The good seed are the children. I think everybody knows what a child is, do they not? Does anyone need an explanation of that? The seed are the children of the kingdom. The king and his dominion. But the tares are the children of the wicked one. Well, who is that wicked one? What's it talking about? Just somebody being bad, some alcoholic, some drunkard? The wicked one. There's only one. It's the enemy of God. All right? That is to say that that initiated wickedness. 39, the enemy, oh, he's going to tell us. The enemy that sowed them is the devil. That old serpent, the dragon, the devil, Lucifer. The harvest is the end of the world, and the reapers are the angels. The angels will take care of the tares. And therefore, the tares are gathered and burned in the fire. So shall it be in the end of the world. That's the way it's going to be. But if, if we, you remember in that uh, Revelation 3, 9, it said that even the Kenites would come and worship at your feet? Why? On the first day of the millennium, every knee shall bow to the true Christ. Doesn't mean they're going to stay there. But God gives everyone an opportunity, even a Kenite, for salvation. If he becomes a follower of Christ, he is no longer a tear. Does that happen? Yes. I can guarantee you it happens. I'm not the judge. Will it last? I don't know. But I have observed it happen. That's for what it's worth, department. Now, this has been kept secret since the beginning. Any time that you're given a clue like that, that means what? Well, let me figure it out. We go to the end? No, you go to the beginning to find out. All right? He he told you. I'm not talking down to you, beloved, but I want to show you how simple this is, all right? Bear with me. Naturally, if he said it happened in the beginning, the best place for you to find out, my friend, is not the end, but go to the beginning 
to understand it. Does that make sense? Sure it does. Genesis chapter 3. That is the beginning of this earth age. There was a first earth age before this when that catabell took place, but be that as it may. He said the devil, if you want to know the names of the devil, make a mental note of um, Revelation chapter 20, verses 1 through 2, and it'll tell you that the serpent, the dragon, the devil, Lucifer, it's all one entity that goes by those names, all right? It's the devil. The serpent, he's the devil himself. How did this seed get sown? Chapter 3, verse 1. Now the serpent, there he is, was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? He knew better, but he's setting her up, all right, too. And the woman said unto the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden. This word trees here in the Hebrew is etz. It means if there's an apple tree out here, yep. We can have that if there's oranges, plums, anything we want. He said we can partake of those. They're good food. Verse 4. But the fruit of the tree which is in the midst, this is different. In the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. Now, the Hebrew language is a fixed language. It's not like English that every generation that comes along reworks it and, you know, and one thing means something else and something something else. Hebrew is fixed, it doesn't float. You have a prime word, and then words come stem from that. The prime word, or the prime root of etz, which is the wooden tree, is atesh, which is the backbone. All right? What's in your backbone, your central nervous system? The knowledge that runs from your little tippy toes to the top of your head. So we're not talking about, God wasn't talking about a wooden tree. He was talking about, there's another prime that comes closer yet, an opening or a closing of the eyes, acha, means tree, acha, the opening or the closing of the eyes. Satan documents which word he's talking about. Incidentally, neither shall you touch it. You know, the word touch wasn't used in the close of this chapter concerning the tree of life. This word in the Hebrew is naga. And among one thing, it means to lie with a woman. All right, we getting there? Now, and the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. He's lying to her, see? For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened. Ah, tash. Not ads. And ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Why? They would have participated in it. And in that day, man died. I mean, death entered the world. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, in other words, she partook of it. And that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof, did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. You got the sequence? Okay? And the eyes of them both were opened. Did it say they both got a a rash from the poison ivy on the tree? I don't think so. All right? Their eyes, autish, were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And they sowed fig leaves. Do you know what? Do you know the parable of the fig tree that Christ said you better know? This is the root of it. All right? Way back here. Fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. Now, did it say that they made masks? I think not. And in Sunday schools throughout this world, they teach Eve ate an apple. It's a lie. Sad. But it's a lie. 
and what road to get somebody started off. If you can't get started right in the beginning, you're never going to understand the rest of God's Word. And there it's propagated. Well, I wonder if what happened could be... I just wonder, maybe. Skip on to verse 15. God caught them. And this is what He said to the serpent. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed. So the serpent does have seed. It shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel. The serpent did. You'll have a little star if you have a King James. That means it refers to Christ. Christ's heels were bruised. They were nailed to the cross. And we shall crush his head, the serpent. Apple time in Georgia, well, unto the woman he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. How many need a definition for the word conception? Eating apples will do it to you, friend. Okay? In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. And so it goes. And then people say, no, you're wrong. You have, you've never read chapter 4, verse 1. You see, Christ said the enemy sowed the wicked children. Well, I know, but I don't know if I want to believe that or not. Well, <laughs> you don't have to. But Christ taught it. And Christ complimented only the two churches that knew that fact. Quite frankly, if you're not in a church that teaches it, you're in trouble. Read what he says to the other seven churches in that little grouping. But that means you must always think, or Satan, will he'll be ahead of you. He'll outfox you. He's good at it. Didn't it say he was more subtle? Do you know what that means? Of course he is. He likes to trick people. But, Pastor Murray, you haven't read chapter 4, verse 1 yet. Let's read it. And Adam knew Eve, his wife. That means he seduced her. And she conceived and bare Cain and said, I have gotten a man from the Lord. If, if, Yahweh in the Hebrew, with the help of God. She did conceive of Adam. But Cain wasn't the child. Listen to what it says in the next verse. And she again. Now I want you to underline that word again. And I want you to get your Strong's Concordance if you haven't already. And I want you to understand what that word means. It is Yasaf in the Hebrew tongue. And it means she continued. Not again. Continued. Now if a woman has one child and continues in labor, what does that mean? It's really hard to understand. I think not. She was having twins. Again, bear his brother Abel, and Abel was a keeper of the sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. You know what happened as that continued on. They both brought forth offerings at the same time before God, meaning they both matured to that age at the same time. Simple, they were twins. They were not identical twins, but they were fraternal twins, which is to say, fraternal twins, which is to say, twins by separate conceptions. Identical twins are twins that are in one water sack. Fraternal twins are two separate pregnancies that are twins. There have been cases where there have, these twins of that nature have even been different races. I mean, ask your doctor. It's, uh, the, I'm, I'm, I don't want to go into too much detail, but I want you to know there's no big deal in this. Now, then was Cain Abel's son? Well, Cain murdered Abel. Was Cain Adam's son? Cain murdered his brother Abel. Where did he get all that honoriness? These other people were innocent. They didn't know anything about murder. But he's evil in his heart. He's jealous of everything, of what his offering and everything else. So he killed his brother. He was then what? The first murderer.
And what did God do to him? He placed a mark on him. A wise person can recognize a Kenite spiritually if you are gifted with spiritual discernment. No big deal. You're not supposed to bother him anyway. If you can't, don't worry about it. No big deal. Yet. But spiritual discernment will get it for you. Okay? But he put that mark on him, and he said, they're going to kill me everywhere I go. Why would he say that? He's Henri. He's a parasite, a vagabond. God told him, he said, you're going to be a vagabond because you present me with that trash you grew from the ground. You're never going to farm again. You'll never see a Kenite farmer, even to this day. They will, they'll own land, but they'll have someone else doing their farming for them. By that I mean with the hoe and the tractor and all that bit. I, God's Word is true. If you just open your eyes and peek through, all right? So, after he put that mark there, Look how sharp Satan can be with his own children. Verse 16 of this fourth chapter. And Cain went out from the presence of the Lord and dwelt in the land of Nod on the east of Eden. Where was that at? It was where part of the six-day creation were. 17. And Cain knew his wife, so was she. she was from that six-day creation. And she conceived and bare Enoch. Oh, wait a minute. Enoch was a... Son of Cain? Not the one you're thinking about, friend. That's why I wanted to read this so you're careful. So that you have the key. And he built a city and called the name of the city after the name of his son, Enoch. And unto Enoch was born Irad, Irad, Mahujael, and Mahujael begat Methuselah. And Methuselah begat Lamech. Now, let me get it right. Now, Methuselah was the oldest man in the world? No, it just sounds that way. Okay? To show you that Satan is tricky. And Lamech, wasn't that the father of Noah? Not this one, friend. You beginning to get it? God puts a mystery in most people... Maybe they never read the Bible because they're biblically illiterate. You couldn't carry on a conversation with them biblically uh, and get any sense out of them. I mean, they are like little children. Well, they, I've been a Christian for 30 years. How dare you say that? Yeah, you bottle-sucking, unpotty-trained Christian. If somebody went to work for me and hadn't learned something after 30 years, I'd fire them just like that. God's Word is power is your peace of mind, is your life. It's important. He wrote it to you personally. What have you done with it? Well, now now wait a minute. You're confusing me with all these names and everything. No, no, no I'm, I'm not trying whatsoever to confuse you. Let's go to verse 25 of this. Let's get the straight of it. Let's get to the bottom. And Adam, ooh, now we've left Cain. We just read Cain's genealogy. You didn't find Adam's name in it anywhere. Do you know why? Adam wasn't involved in it. Now let's go to Adam's genealogy and find Cain, all right? If Cain were Adam's son. Got it? And Adam knew his wife again, and she bare, him, bare a son and called his name Seth. For God, she said, hath appointed me another seed instead of Abel, whom Cain slew. And to Seth, to him also there was born a son, and he called his name Enosh, Nos rather, then began men to call upon the name of the Lord. Now chapter 5 gives you Adam's genealogy, and I guarantee you, you will not find Cain in it because Cain was not the son of Adam. Listen to it for yourself. This is the Word of God. If you want to argue with it, go ahead. This is the book of the generations of Adam. Do you know what that means? His progeny, his offspring. In the day that God created man in the likeness of God made he him. Male and female created he them and blessed them and called their name Adam. Both male and female were called Adam because Adam in the Hebrew is Adam. It means ruddy complected. 
All those that He created, it is also a term in the Hebrew for mankind. That's what He called them was mankind. In the day when they, when they were created. Three, here comes Adam. And Ha-Adam in the Hebrew, the Adam, the one we're talking about, lived in 130 years and begat a son in his own likeness after his image, called his name Seth. Didn't say anything about Cain, did it? Uh-uh, friend. Remember tares? Remember the mystery? And in the days of Adam, uh, and the days of Adam, after he had gotten Seth, were 800 years, and he begat sons and daughters. And all the days of Adam he lived. Now, Enosh, skip on down with me for the sake of time. There in verse 13 is a Mahuyel. Let's go all the way down if we may to verse 18. And Jared lived in 160 and two years, and he begat Enoch. Whoa! Now here's another Enoch. It's, he was named Enoch to keep you on your toes. He's not the same as that evil Enoch in Cain's genealogy. He was the one that was so perfect, God took him. He never died. And Jared lived uh, after he begat Enoch 800 years and begat sons and daughters, and all the days of Jared were 960 and two years, and he died. And Enoch lived 60 and five years and begat Methuselah. Now, we had a Methuselah a while ago. El in the Hebrew is God, but you can call a dog God if you want to, E-L. It could point to that. But here is the sacred name, L-A-H, which is Yah, or in the Hebrew tongue, Yahweh. In other words, we have a different, we have a, it's like God telling you, how sharp are you? And Enoch walked with God after he begat Methuselah 300 years and begat sons and daughters. And all the days of Enoch were 300 years. 65, and Enoch walked, 24, important, God, and Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. He transfigured him. He was good. He was perfect. And Methuselah, this is important, lived in 100 A.E. and seven years and begat Lamech. There's another Lamech. And this one would be the father of Noah, who would go through the flood. In Genesis 6, Nephilim in the Hebrew tongue, fallen angels, uh, Geber, offspring, giants, began to mix with the daughters of Adam. And God brought on the flood and destroyed those that He would. Well, then we don't really have a problem, do we? If the Kenites were living at this time and the flood got them all, as well as it did the Geber and the Nephilim were taken away by God. That's just, it comes from the Hebrew Napha fallen. Fallen angels were re, retreated. But you see, beloved, you have to know the difference between Eretz in the Hebrew tongue and world. World is Kamos. It could be the, the, the evil part of the world. Eretz is the soil meaning world. All right? And in that uh, sixth chapter, something for you to think about, God told Noah, take two of every flesh aboard the ark. Well, we've got a lot of people. It's only been about somewhere between 90, 80, 90 generations back to the time we're talking about, 6,000 years. Well, we've had a lot of changing if they all came from one. And yes, Eve was the mother of all living, but only in as much as Christ would come from her womb, umbilical cord to umbilical cord, and you're either in Christ or you don't have eternal life. Did the Kenite get through the flood? Turn with me to First Chronicles chapter 2. The Old Testament, First Chronicles chapter 2, verse 55. I assure you they did, all right? They certainly did. This second chapter is the genealogy of Judah, the true tribe of Judah. But Judah has hired him some people to do his scribe work for him. Judah never liked to keep books. That's a trademark of those tribes even that went north over the Caucasus Mountains and were later called Caucasians, aligning with Adam, ruddy-complected in the Hebrew tongue. 
and uh, they just don't like bookwork. That's why they get so lost and are not so familiar with God's Word. Let's just let old Harry do it. Well, you better look who Harry is when you hire somebody to do your thinking for you, all right? This is verse 55. This is tagged on to Judah. And the families of the scribes, not Judah, these are the families of the scribes which dwelt at Jabez, the Tyrathites, the Shimeathites, the Shushathites. These are the K-E-N-I-T-E-S, translated sons of Cain. You better believe they made it through the flood. And the Bible so declares it. That came of Hemoth. Remember that name. Hemoth. The father of the house of Rechab. Thus the, they would be called on in the Bible Rechabites. Yes, they made it through the flood. Well, when did they start calling themselves Eudas? That Jesus would mention this. We're teaching Jeremiah right now on television. Jeremiah chapter 35, just real quickly. And there is a written report there of that happening. Jeremiah chapter 35, the word which came unto Jeremiah from the Lord in the days of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, saying, Go unto the house of the Rechabites. <gasps> My word, that's God telling Jeremiah to go down to the house of the Rechabites. Do you remember who Rechab was? He was the father of the house of Hemoth, Kenites, okay? And speak unto them and bring them into the house of the Lord. My word. Unto, into one of the chambers and give them wine to drink. When you are in the house of God and you partake of wine, what are you partaking of? Think about it. Today, I mean. Then I took Jeazaniah, whom Yah hears in the Hebrew tongue, the son of Jeremiah, whom God launches, launches forth, the son of Habazaniah and his brethren and all his sons and the whole house of the Rechabites. Whoa, did you read that? Jeremiah himself is of the house of the Rechabites? No, no, no. Who was Jeremiah the prophet's father? You read it in chapter 1, verse 1 of the book of Jeremiah. It's Hilkiah. This is a false Jeremiah. In other words, a Jeremiah that's a Kenite going by the name Jeremiah. You see, God likes to see how sharp you are. See if you're awake. All right? And yet at the same time, it can be a little bit confusing, all right? Unless you keep awake, all right? And I brought them into the house of the Lord into the chamber of the sons of Hanan, the son of uh, Igdila, the, a, a man of God, which was in the chamber and so forth. Verse 5, And I set before the sons of the house of the Rechabites pots full of wine cups. And I said unto them, Drink ye wine. And you got a bunch of Kenites right in the house of God, Bethel, drink wine. But they said, we will drink no wine for Yonadab, the son of Rechab. You see how the genealogy of the Kenites go along here. Our father commanded us, saying, ye shall drink no wine, neither ye nor your sons forever. Neither shall ye build house, nor sow seed. Do you know why? They can't farm, okay? Don't do any good to sow it. Nor plant vineyards, nor have any. But all your days you shall dwell in tents. You'll be vagabonds, wanderers, that ye may live many days in the land where you are strangers. Why? The mark, remember? People would want to kill him if they, you know, if they realize, hey, he doesn't grow anything, so he's got to live off of our produce. Like a bloodsucker, all right? Just doesn't work too good to stay healthy that way if people start uh, taking notes. Thus have we obeyed the voice of Jonadab, the son of Rechab, our father, in all that he has charged us to drink no wine all our days. We, our wives, our sons, nor our daughters, nor to build houses for us to dwell in, neither have we vineyards, nor field, nor seed. 
But we have dwelt in tents and have obeyed and done according to all that Jonadab, our father, commanded us. Do you know that they're very close-knit? Do you know they do obey their father? Do you know they're very successful in accomplishing this? But it came to pass, this is why they took up the name Eudas. It came to pass when Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came up into the land that we said, Come. And let us go to Jerusalem for fear of the army of the Chaldeans and for fear of the army of the Syrians. So we dwell at Yahushalam. We dwell at Jerusalem, which means they live in the land of Judea, which means they are Eudas now, all right, for protection. They They had this in mind a long time before because back in Chronicles, which wasn't too awful long before, They were already scribes. Keeping books, honey. We'll take care of your books for you. Tell you what's going on. Tell you how much you owe. And subtract out what change you get back. And it'll all be fine. Don't you worry about anything. All is well. Be careful, my friend, when you study the Word of God. So we see then that, yes, they lived through the flood. Yes, there was still an interaction between the tribe of Judah, and them, as we continue on. But now wait just a minute. Something comes to my mind. Moses, as it's written, Moses married a Kenite. It says it in the good old King James. Now see, think. I want you to make a note in case you're ever asked that. Who did Moses marry? Many times it's written... He married a Kenite, but that's a geographical identification. When Moses went into that land of Jared the first time, what did he find? There were some girls trying to water sheep, but what was happening? They were driving the girls away so that the Kenites could water their sheep first. Why? Because they weren't of them. They only lived in the land of the Kenites, which makes them what geographically? Kenites. If you live in Texas, you're a Texan. You may be an Irishman, and you're very fortunate if you are, but if you're something else... <laughs> anyway, anyway, if you're in Texas, you know, that, that's why... But make a note. Numbers, chapter 10, verse 29... And you will find there, give or take me a verse or two there, I believe it's 29 if my memory doesn't fail me, and it rarely does. Uh, 29, you'll find that he was, he married his father, Regul is used there, which is his title, priest, was a Midianite priest. What, What does that make him? You will find by Abraham's second wife, In Genesis chapter 25, Keturah was her name. Some say Sarah died. I don't know. Perhaps she did. But he had quite a few children by this second wife, Keturah, and one of them was Median. That's who Moses married. All right? Enough said. Now, don't ever let anyone tell you that Moses married a Kenite, that Kenite slipped into the line of Christ anywhere. It didn't happen. It's just that people are biblically illiterate and get, they don't know the difference, all right? Which there's no sin in that. If you haven't studied, you don't know, and so you don't. Nobody certainly knows everything. We don't, but we're working on it, and we praise God for what knowledge that He grants us. Well, did Jesus teach anywhere else that Cain was of the devil. It's important. Go to St. John chapter 8. Just real quickly. I'm going to wind this up here with about a couple of three more stops. But we want to... Let's put the old nail into it pretty good here while we're at it. Go through some simple little old scriptures. Jesus is teaching. And we're going to be in the land of Judea. So you're going to have a lot of Eudas or Jews around. Some of them would be those that call for Christ's crucifixion. I guarantee you it wasn't our brother Judah. It was those that only claimed to be of Judah. Okay, verse 31, St. John chapter 8. 
Then said Jesus, in the New Testament, of course, then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him. He owed us. That they believe him now. If you continue in my word, then you are my disciples indeed. You're my students. And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. You're going to know these ties and the mystery, and that's going to give you peace of mind because you're going to understand what the world brings upon us, all right? That's being set free by the truth, is to know God's plan. They answered him, We be Abraham's seed, and we're never in bondage to any man. How sayest thou, ye shall be made free? Jesus answered them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Whosoever committeth sin is a servant of sin. 35, And the servant abideth not in the house forever, but the son for, abideth forever. Christ is going to be there, all right? If the son, that's to say the truth or the true seed, therefore shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. I know, Christ speaking, I know that ye are Abraham's seed, but you seek to kill me, because my word hath no place in you. What does the word Abraham mean in the Hebrew tongue? Father of many nations. Abraham in Christ is the father of all. Everybody's a child of Abraham, spiritually speaking, okay? 38, I speak that which I have seen with my Father. Notice the uppercase F, capital F, Father. And ye do that which you have seen with your Father. Lowercase, small f. They answered and said unto him, Abraham is our father. Jesus said unto them, If you were Abraham's children, you would do the works of Abraham. But now you seek to kill me, a man that hath told you the truth, which I have heard of God, this did not Abraham. Ye do the deeds of your father. Again, Christ is implying. Then he said they to him, We be not born of fornication. We have one father, even God. We didn't come through uh, a um, Judah by Tamar. 42, Jesus said unto them, if God were your father, ye would love me. For I proceeded forth and came from God. Neither came I of myself, but he sent me. Why do you not understand my speech? Even because you cannot hear my word. Ye are of your father the devil. And the lust of your father ye will do. He was a murderer. You still with me? He was a murderer from the beginning. Now let me see. That's going to take a little figure, isn't it? Who was the first murderer? Oh, it was Cain, wasn't it? You betcha. He's telling them you're the children of Cain. From the beginning, and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh of a lie, he speaketh of his own. For he is a liar and the father of it. And because I tell you the truth, you believe me not. Which of you convinceth me of sin? And if I say the truth, why do you not believe me? He that is of God heareth God's words. Ye therefore hear them not, because ye are not of God. Who are they of? Synagogue of Satan. Jesus taught it. It's just that you have to have eyes to see and ears to hear. But did he, did he say it again? Well, my word, he said it in Matthew 13. He said the, Satan, the devil planted the wicked seed to start with. Well, could we have another witness? Well, turn back with me to Matthew 23. And we're going to leave Christ then as far as his witness. And we're going to one other and that's going to be it. Chapter 23 is the great chapter in Matthew that's known as the woes, the eight woes. They're the exact opposite of the eight beatitudes you will find in the Gospels. The eight woes. Woe means you don't want nothing to do with it, friend, or at least you'd better be aware of it. 
23, Then spake Jesus, verse 1, spake Jesus to the multitude and to his disciples, saying, The scribes and the Pharisees sit in the seat of Moses. Now that's as far as I'm going in the first part of this chapter. What's the scribes and the Pharisees? He told you back in 1 Chronicles chapter 2, verse 55, who the scribes were. And if they sit in Moses' seat, what was Moses? He was the lawgiver. So it seems like they moved right in, and they're the ones giving the law now. And then he continues his woes. I want to go to the last woe, verse 29, in this same chapter. Christ speaking. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees and hypocrites. Hypocrite in the Greek means a play actor. You're pretending to be somebody you're not. Because you build the tombs of the prophets and garnish the sepulchres of the righteous and say, If we had been in the days of our fathers, we, no, not us, we would not have been partakers with them in the blood of the prophets. No way. 31. Wherefore, ye be witness unto yourselves that ye are the children, the seed of them which killed the prophets. Fill ye up then the measure of your fathers, ye serpents. Why? The serpent was their father. Ye serpents, you generation, that means offspring of vipers. How can you escape the damnation of hell? Are you sure he's talking to Kenites here? Well, I don't know. Christ is a pretty good teacher. He'll surely explain it to us. Let's continue on just a little bit. Wherefore, behold, I send unto you prophets and wise men and scribes, and some of them you shall kill and crucify, and some of them shall you scourge in your synagogues and persecute them from city to city, that upon you may come all the righteous blood shed upon the earth from the blood of righteous Abel. Who slew Abel? Cain. And there you have it. To Zacharias, son of Borachias, whom ye slew between the temple and the altar, verily I say unto you, all these things shall come upon this generation. Well, there we got it. Teachings of Christ. Pretty plain. Does that mean you should hate somebody? No. He said, leave them alone. But do be wise enough to understand. I wonder if Paul ever taught anything about this. Real quickly in closing, turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. You bet Paul taught it. Paul gave one of the greatest warnings to a Christian in this 11th chapter of 2 Corinthians that you'll ever read anywhere if you take the entire chapter, which we're not, and understand it. Paul begins in that chapter 11. It kind of reads in the English, uh, would, would to God you could bear with me a little in my folly, indeed bear with me. It doesn't really follow that you could be sincere and listen to me. There were a lot of super preachers around and Paul only spoke colloquial Greek, and he was kind of a country boy, and he wasn't quite up to their par, you know. So he said, just bear with me just a minute till we get down to some common sense. Verse 2, for I am jealous. Remember, Paul brought a lot of people to Christ. He said, I'm jealous over you with godly jealousy, for I have espoused you. Do you know what espoused means? I've engaged you to be married to one husband. That, you may present, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. Do you know what a virgin is? Okay, we got that. Verse 3. But I fear, lest by any means as the serpent... Paul wouldn't teach this, would he? As the serpent beguiled... That Greek word is expatio. It only has one meaning, to wholly seduce. And don't ever forget it. Holy seduced Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupt from the simplicity that is in Christ. But you just let the simple truth slip right over you. He continues, and he says in verse 14, and he's talking about the super preachers. He said, I can pull the rug right out from under them with my knowledge and the word. I may not talk as fancy as they do, but I can slip the rug right out from under them when it comes to knowledge because they transform themselves into being Christ's representative. And he said, and no marvel, that's no big deal, for Satan himself 
is transformed into an angel of light. There's just one little problem with that. That word transformed in the Greek is disguised. Satan comes disguised as an angel of light. Who is our angel? Of, who is our light? Christ. I guarantee you he isn't. Now we can begin to understand why that Christ would complement the two churches that know the truth and understand what difference it makes. It makes the difference between the true Christ and the false Christ. Because if you know Satan's children, you know where Satan shall appear. You know what he will be doing. He's coming to this earth. There's not going to be any flyaway doctrine before that happens. And many people, do you know what he's going to be saying when he comes? I've come to fly you away. Because that's what people want to hear. And boy, are they going for a ride. Expatio. That's fast express. I really shouldn't say that, but. How many Greek students do we have in here? Oh, well, be that as it may. I apologize, but whatever. Don't be deceived. There's still another place. Would John teach it? You better believe John taught it. I, I said I was going to let you off the hook there, but I, I, I can't resist. John, that's the epistles of John, all right? We've already been in the other John. I want to go to the first epistle of John. Uh, chapter what three okay chapter 3 verse 11 for this is the message that you heard from the beginning that you should love one another not as Cain who was of that wicked one meaning progeny and slew his brother and wherefore slew he him because his own works were evil and his brother's righteous Marvel not, my brother, and if the world hates you. If you tell the truth and you teach the truth, yes, the world's not exactly going to be overjoyed with you. Because the world would, they're biblically illiterate. They rarely ever study God's Word. They hear a one verse Charlie, teach one verse, and then none of the rest of the Word. They're good people. I love them. But you can see how they're set up for the great deception. Kenites, the sons of Cain. The opposite of the key of David. There you have both lines. Whereby you can recognize in the world today what's going on. Better understand prophecies and certainly can understand the rest of the parables. When you understand that. It's like opening an old feed sack. If you don't get it, you know, I don't guess I'm, out, I'm dating myself and I should never use that anymore. I'm just curious. How many of you in this room have ever opened a feed sack? Oh, I'm traveling in good company here. If you don't get it started just right, it's all hacked up, you know, and you say, wow, what I <clears throat> like this. But if you get it right, whoosh, boy, I mean, it just opens up. Well, God's Word's kind of that way. If you get it right in the beginning, it kind of opens up for you, and it's a good word, all right? So see that you do. Main thing, Christ is our Savior, and even the tares can accept and follow Him if they so choose. You're a servant, a student, that is to teach God's Word in an humble, straightforward way, whereby people can see that mystery that has been hidden since the beginning. All right, let us pray. Father, we thank you for your word, your truth. Be with us. We ask it in Yeshua's precious name. Amen.